We have a full agenda today. So first and foremost, we will now call this regularly scheduled uh, Board of Supervisor meeting to order. If we can all rise for a moment of silence. <coughs> Right. Mr. Barton, will you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, a few housekeeping things we have to do before we get to public comments. Uh, we have internet down at this building, so we will not be able to live stream. We are recording and we'll upload it to... Uh, YouTube, hopefully, here soon. Uh, internet service providers having some issues. Um, moving on to a couple other things. We have, this will be one of our board members' last days, more than likely, this we have a special call meeting, Mr. Barton. And we have something special for you. <laughs> it's actually a bill. Wow. It's actually a bill. Mr. Barton. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That's the old courthouse. What it is. What's the new one? Maybe we'll get you an updated one later. Uh, on a serious note, Mr. Barton, we uh, appreciate the last several years you've served with us. Uh, looking forward to you having a good future and uh, like I said we have a very long meeting today so we're not through with you yet no you're not we're not through with you yet you're not. No. Um, but thank you sir uh, another piece that we need to uh, talk about we have a special today is we have some legislators who were just elected I guess Amy Locker just walked in and Tim Griffin so we will take a minute after public comments to have you two come forward that way we know you all have a busy schedule and get back to your uh, regular day. Um, and beyond that, I think the agenda is as it is currently still. So let's go on to, do we have a public comment sheet? Yeah. In the meantime, while we're getting our public comment sheet, we, will, we have uh, members of the public who have signed up to speak. You will be given three minutes to speak as an individual, five minutes as a group. Uh, that's a different one. Five minutes as a group. If you could state your name and address for the record, uh, Mr. Reed here will keep track of time and try to give you a 30 second warning and tell you when to stop. Uh, and uh, beyond that, just please be as brief as possible. If you could, as we got a long agenda. So, first on, first on here, and Tim, you just want to speak at the legislator side or did you want to speak during the public comments? Yeah, awesome. All right, we'll just say for you after that. All right, Beth Ann Driscoll. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Increasing the transit accidency tax has been on the uh, board's issues to be discussed for over a year now. My arguments remain consistent throughout every meeting that I've come. Uh, I feel very strongly about this. Uh, I think that it is going to hinder Nelson County a large amount by raising the TOT to double what it currently is. We will lose guests staying at our uh, our hotels, at our cabin rentals, at our campsites. We will lose income to revenues such as the breweries, distilleries, the agricultural uh, industries, the orchards, because there will be no guests staying at our cabins. Tourism has already been greatly hit this year throughout the country. Um, it has been reducing in numbers over the past three years, 2020 and 2021, brought in a substantial increase. You saw a large amount of revenue from our taxes for those two years. And this year has been one of the hardest years for anyone in the lodging industry. People are struggling with making payments for their groceries. They're not going to be having the extra money to spend a large amount in taxes. They'll choose to go somewhere else. You will lose your guests, which means you will lose business in every industry across all of Nelson County. 
you want more money, the best thing that you could do would be actually to reduce the DOT, but if you're not going to reduce it, then at least keep it the same because you're not going to get any more money through the taxes by raising them. You're going to deter people from coming here. You will lose guests at not only lodging industries, but every other business in Nelson County. I fully believe this. I love Nelson County. I've been in this industry for over 20 years. And one of the businesses in Nelson County that has made more of an impact over the last 20 years would be us. We've changed our company numerous times to keep updated so that we can keep guests coming here because Nelson County is incredible. We have so much to offer, but you won't be offering that if you take away places for people to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to Edith Napier. Good afternoon. I'm Edith Napier, 43, Napier Loop, Arrington, Virginia. I want to thank the board for its work on behalf of Nelson County in 2023. Thank you. Mr. Barton, special thanks for your service and wishing you the best in your next adventure. Thank you. Two items I would like to address today. First one, I come to you on behalf of the Nelson County Juneteenth Celebration Committee requesting $5,000 to support the 2024 celebration. The Juneteenth Committee is made up of citizens from all districts of Nelson County with a diverse ethnic and racial background. I'm requesting the county to support the countywide Juneteenth celebration in a similar manner as it supports other celebrations of the county. The Nelson Heritage Center has been gracious enough to allow the Juneteenth <coughs> Committee to host the celebration there. However, be aware the Nelson Heritage Center and the Juneteenth Committee are two separate entities. Look forward to seeing each of you at the celebration. The second issue, Rep requests you, you do not approve the contract for speed cameras in front of the schools unless you are prepared to set up a collection agency at the same time. According to everything I have heard, the contractor will provide the county the information on the speeder. And if the speeder is out of the county or state, it will be up to the county to run them down and collect the fine. However, unless I'm wrong, the contractor will be owed 40% of the intended revenue once the information on the speeder is turned over to, to the county, whether the county is able to collect the fines or not. We want our children to be safe. We want to stop individuals from speeding in our school zone. However, we do not need a system with a contractor which will end up putting an undue burden on the taxpayers while trying to collect fines. Thank you. Thank you. James Bibb. Good afternoon, my name is James Bibb, uh, Phoenix Road, Arrington, Virginia. Uh, I'm going to speak on real briefly that uh, just yesterday while dropping off my uh, two high schoolers at, at the high school as we were late because of the weather delay, there were uh, no flashing lights, no school zone, school zone warnings uh, in effect, and uh, obviously no law enforcement presence there either. Um, they were there helping uh, school buses, children, teachers, students, and anyone to make that crossing into the school as folks were traveling 60, 70 miles per hour. Um, now that being said, I was truly so concerned, uh, visibly not so much. Uh, I have stood here and, and spoken in opposition of ATE or school zone traffic cameras on more than one occasion, so my position is not unknown to the board. ATA, ATA is not, not enforcement, but it only generates revenue. That being said, the lines between enforcement of laws and revenue generation should never be blurred. And the argument of enforcement already being revenue generating is moot because I'm opposed to that as it only impacts those of low income. Considering the various opinions here today on the topic, I offer this. 
If you consider a vote cast and approval based on the children and the safety thereof, in no way should any revenue generated by ATE, by ATE be cast into the general fund. In no way should any revenue generated by ATE be handed to the school board. None of this is a benefit to the kids directly. Instead, create a scholarship fund for Nelson County High School seniors and their post high school education endeavors. Every dollar from ATE into this fund directly impacts the kids positively for the rest of their lives. Not to be wasted away on various spending initiatives that offer no real long-term benefit to the future of Nelson. On another note, I continue to remain opposed to increases in TOT tax without offset considerations to the constituents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is no one else who is on this agenda at this time, or in the public comments section at this time. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Mr. Brugier? Good afternoon. My name is Tommy Brugier, 187 Jacks Hill Road. A couple things I have to speak about. Uh, one, I'm very appreciative for lead out of finishing paving Jacks Hill Road. Uh, also, we had Fleetwood Hill Road paved, as well as Cal Hollow all this fall. And uh, it's a benefit to everybody who lives on that road. We're tired of gravel roads. And if we can do more of it, I hope we can. Uh, another thing with VDOT, we had a snow on the mountain, but yet they put down salt all along 151, 56, where there was never a plate hit the roads. It's our money that they're wasting. If it snows, put the salt down. It's not only ruining the roads, it's ruining our cars. We have brake lines constantly going out because of salt in the wintertime, especially when it's not needed. Another thing we need to do is <clears throat> we have a lot of trees going over here due to heavy rains and dying uh, trees <coughs> on the road. We need to get those out of the road and out of the right away as soon as possible. There was one Pine Street fell on Rosen Road the other day. <clears throat> they came and cut it off right the edge of the road, but it still needs to be moved out of the ditches. And so people, if they run off the road, they won't be hitting a tree. Also for mowing and snow removal, you need to get this stuff out of the right ways. Uh, I said something probably a year ago, we need to remove all those tires that have been thrown over going up Fleetwood Hill. Uh, and I don't know who's responsible for doing that, but they need to be removed. Not only is a fire hazard, it's a visual impact and has been property has been sold. I'm sure that whoever bought it uh, doesn't want to see those tires there anymore. Um, another thing I said something very ago, we need to expand the uh, parking lots down at the Piney River Trail, Pine, <coughs> down at Piney River, that needs to be expanded. I said something like this probably over a year ago, and as well as the entrance to the Appalachian Trail in Tyro, that parking lot uh, needs to be expanded Thanks. there as well. Since we've COVID has come, uh, we have more and more people in outdoors now. So we need to provide parking areas so they won't impact uh, the roads. So I think that's what all I have. Thank you, sir. Any other public comments at this time? Hearing none, we will close the public comment section of this agenda. Uh, this is now a special time to meet our legislators. We have two with us today, Mr. Tim Griffin and Amy Woffer. If you guys could please come forward real quick. We haven't done this in a while, so we're, we're working on uh, uh, what we're supposed to do, but uh, if you could maybe just take a second to introduce yourselves one at a time, however, and then uh, we're gonna talk to you. Uh, yes, if you could, yep, yeah, address the board. Thank you so much, Nelson Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Delegate Elect Amy Lawfer for District 55, which includes uh, Rockfish, Bobber, and Skyler, 
as well as most of Albemarle County, as well as a uh, small area in Louisa and Savannah. Um, by way of the introduction, I'm from a dairy farm in Wisconsin. I am one of eight children. It took me six years to graduate college. I'm first generation. I packed fish in Alaska, put burgers at Wendy's, and rented cars at Avis. <laughs> um, but I got my degree in geology. I did water chemistry for the state of Wisconsin right out of uh, college until I went into the Peace Corps and I was stationed in another farming community um, outside the Blue Ridge Mountains in um, Jamaica where there's the Blue Mountain Coffee. So I just want to mention that because 25 years later, the two programs I started are still going, which is a community garden and a reading program. I came back, I got my master's in education. I taught middle school math and science. I actually taught next to the World Trade Center. We evacuated that day and the school became a search and rescue. Um, at the end of that school year, I moved to Charlottesville. I've been down in this area for the past 20 years. I served, I continued teaching middle school math and science until our second child was born with medical issues. But I, be, I got elected to the Charlottesville School Board for seven years. I was vice chair and chair. Um, I ran for state senate back in 2019, got really close, and I'm proud to say that I will be a representative, a part of Nelson County um, for this session as a delegate. And I read through your priorities. I think maybe we'll be talking about them. Uh, but just so you guys know, I put in for um, for the committees, we won't find out until January, but I put in for agriculture, education, and healthcare. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Mr. Griffin. <clears throat> hey, uh, my name is Tim Griffin, and I'm the, the new delegate elect from House District 53. I'm honored to be here. I've known, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've known you for a, a good many years now, so it's great to be here and to be in front of you and, and see, you know, see you in this role and, and be able to serve here in Nelson County. Uh, House District 53 covers about 70% uh, of Nelson County. It starts up in the northern half of Bedford County, and I live in Forest, and then it goes through all of Amherst County and, and here to Nelson. And I was at Sweetbriar College yesterday, just kind of thinking about all the amazing things that we have in here, here in the district, from the Blue Ridge Parkway and Poplar Forest and the D-Day Memorial over in Bedford to Sweetbriar and then Walton's Mountain over here in Nelson. There's just so many amazing things in this district. It's such a beautiful district. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, you know, we, the political party I belong to, I'm a Republican, so we'll be serving in the majority. We have, in the, excuse me, in the minority. We have put in our uh, committee request, but that'll be determined by the other political party. I put in for courts of justice, uh, education, and uh, privileges and elections, because I am uh, I'm a former prosecutor. I was, a, I was a, a prosecutor when uh, Daniel was a defense attorney, and now Daniel is your commonwealth attorney. Um, the legendary Commonwealth Attorney of Nelson County, and I, I get to do uh, all kinds of different civil don't, law. Don't do that too, Zico. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of uh, committees that we get. Um, you know, when we, uh, Amy and I got the opportunity to meet in Richmond uh, during our, our training, uh, when they were kind of introducing us to how things ha uh, go in Richmond, I think there's a great um, opportunity for, you know, when, when a county has split representation, where you have somebody from one party and, and somebody from a different political party, because there might be uh, different priorities for the different political party and there might be times where there's something that we we have a greater say in and we have more um, of an ability to fight for and there might be times where Amy and her district um, you know where she comes from they might be able to fight for that in, in a better way so I think it's a great opportunity for Nelson um, and I think and I hope that there's going to be things that Amy and I will be able to we, we've discussed this previously be able to work together on even though we might there be times where we don't necessarily agree on a lot of the issues I think there'll be a lot of areas of overlap um, uh, I do, something I did notice, and I do, and I've noticed this before in my visits to, to Richmond, is that I do think there's a growing difference in the interests of rural, uh, rural and urban communities. And, you know, it's incumbent upon me to say this is a, a rural district, and rural districts are the backbone of Virginia, our farms are the, back, the backbone of Virginia. Um, you know, stay away from our vehicles, stay away from our businesses, stay away from our farms, stay away from our, our way of life. And that's kind of what I view my role um, to be in Richmond, is to really fight for people that, uh, the people that I view as the backbone of the economy, of our culture, of everything going on here in Virginia. So I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to listen to more of what, what your agenda is. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. First and foremost, uh, again, we thank you both for coming here. We have not had the legislators come and see us in I can't remember, Mr. Reed. Have we done it in the last seven, eight years? No. So this is uh, this is 
not necessarily monumental, but it is the step in it, hopefully a regular tradition for us as a board. Um, as you do know, we do have some legislative priorities. One of our lead liaisons is uh, Mr. David Blunt, which I'm sure you both have kind of interacted with him through the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission. Uh, he tries to uh, grab all of our ideas and put them in some palatable verbiage that, that makes sense. Um, and I think each of these members of this board, is, uh, and I know Mr. Barton has some very specific things he would like to talk about, might want to bring some awareness to it a little bit. We're going to try not to take too much time. Uh, we know you won't have any answers uh, to everything that we have. We also know that, that you're both getting into it, so find out what committees you're going to be on. Um, and there'll be some committees that some of our stuff's going to go to. We'll need some advocacy there. Um, and so we look forward to that continued cooperation uh, with that. Um, I think at this time, you know, I know Mr. Reed and Mr. Barton specifically probably want to touch on some education related stuff. Uh, Mr. Barton specifically on, um, I want to mention the, the chart. Mr. Reed, do you think you can touch on that? The impact of the change in the compositing, the compositing index. I think if you could stick with that one, and I'll just talk on line of duty benefits. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Barton, you get some time to talk about education as a whole. Sound good? Very good. Uh, you don't need us to stand up if you don't want to, because we talk a lot sometimes. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Reed, why don't you kick it off, and then we'll go to you, Mr. Barton. Um, first of all, thank you both for being here, and thank you for reaching out to us prior to this, because I won't be saying anything now that you haven't already heard. But um, uh, this opportunity is great, and on behalf of, for the benefit of everyone here, I'll bring it up again, which has to do with the, uh, the composite index and the amount of funding that uh, uh, our county has to put up to uh, fund our schools. Um, the the JLARC study, which came out last year, I know you're really familiar with that, and it had recommendations in it that... Um, um, that were included not only in the TJPDC legislative program, but also the Virginia Association of Counties, um, uh, which, you know, I'm on the education committee with them, and so we had, you know, some comments on that going forward. Um, j just to uh, let everybody know that uh, the composite index this year, because of the way that it's computed, um, the, uh, the increase I believe we had this year in the amount of funding that we have to provide uh, was increased over 13%. Um, our school budget is going up uh, anyway, so the fact that we have to have a larger percentage of our county tax revenue go towards our schools um, hits us as hard as anybody else in the Commonwealth uh, this go-round. So anything that you all can do to try to balance that out so that the rural communities like our own, which has some discrepancy between the, um, the decreasing, uh, well, just recently we have an increase in enrollment, but it had been decreasing for a while, and the, um, the, uh, the amount of uh, real estate assessments that we have, um, because of wintergreen, our assessments tend to be higher than most rural communities, and you put those two things together, and. Um, when it comes to budget time this year, it's going to be really difficult for us to figure out how we're going to be able to, you know, finance uh, the balance that we have to do when we do the budget. So thank you very much for being here and anything that you all can do to um, try to revamp that, change priorities, or give counties more money and revenue for schools this, uh, this year would be appreciated. Great. Um, Mr. Parr, did you have anything? Um, yeah, I'll just be brief, but um, I know Jay Lark was just mentioned, um, and if you haven't had a chance to review that, it's very eye-opening. Um, you know, when it comes to the funding that's provided to the local communities versus the unfunded mandates that come from the state, um, the, the discrepancy is really unfair um, to the local community, and, it, and it's a burden on the local community. So just encourage you to, um, you both mentioned education, and I encourage you to, to review that report and Mr. Barr. Do me a favor. Would you move that desk thing out of the way so I can see them? Well, I think it's and move no, over no, there. No, 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 no. It's all right. Can you just move that? Uh, can you move that a little bit? Just a little bit more. That's good. Okay. Um, 
I was school teacher for 40 years. And Talk into the mic, Mr. Barton. I was a school teacher for 40 years, and these people will tell you that I knew what I was doing. And what I did was um, very pragmatic. What I attempted to do worked. Now, when the whole idea of um, uh, SOLs and testing, et cetera, came down, you know, I, I, was, still, I was teaching. And I, I don't impugn the motives of that idea at all. You know, people were trying to do something to make the schools better. Now, however, it became clear after a while. Um, I, I, I retired in 2010 because my wife became very ill and I had to take care of her for the next seven years. But even before I retired, you could see the unintended consequences of, of, of the testing and the SOL. And, and people recognized this was a really bad idea and it wasn't working. You know, that, that's how I judge things. Do, do they work or do, do, do they not work? And, and this wasn't working. And, and, and people, it was clear to people that that was true, but they wanted to make it work. So they turned to the universities and the universities, the people within the universities, I know, recognized that this had been a bad idea because of the pressure put on the teachers, the pressure put on the students, the pressure put on the parents, the pressure put on the school boards, that it was not a good idea and it wasn't working. But the universities being, I don't know, I can't really speak for them, said, hey, we can help you. Your kids do better on the test. Instead of saying what they should have said, that they had the courage to say that this idea is not working. And then you had the um, whole industry, you know, the whole, whole industry evolved in, to get the kids to do better on the test. And that is part of um, the problem we have here. Now, a few weeks ago, I attended the VACO conference, and I went to the me meeting on education, and they were talking about what these guys are talking about, which is, is clear. And more money needs to be made available to the schools. But one of the people in the, in the teachers, uh, in the education meeting, who was the president of VACO last year, said, we're not going to go anywhere until we get rid of the SOLs. Now, you don't have to get rid of testing. You have to get rid of the consequences of failing the test. You have to get rid of the, the emphasis on getting uh, teachers for the kids to do better on the test. Any good teacher knows that education has to do with inspiration, has to do with nurturing, has to do with love. It, 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 it does not have to do with getting kids to do better on the test. What, what that whole business did was empowered lousy teachers. Instead of making education and teaching what it is, a wonderful thing to do, something, a, a, a wonderful life. And, 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 and I implore you to think about really only real plausible solution to this problem that we face. And, 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 to, 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 and that's to get rid of it. Get, get, you, you, you can have testing, but the whole thing that revolves around it has to be gotten rid of. Until you do that, you're not going to empower teachers. You're not going to get teachers that are enthusiastic about what they're doing. You, you have created an environment not just in Nelson County, but in schools across the state, of, 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 of the enjoyment of being in school. Now, COVID added to that problem. But the solution is not after school programs, which historically don't work. The solution is to make children feel part of a, uh, something that, that is important, to feel that parents that, 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 that allow teachers to be creative allow students to become learners. I don't say that, I say this with great emotion and great passion. 
And I, I would not bother you with this if I felt that this was not a solution that was not plausible or possible. You know, I, both of you want to be on the education committee. Find teachers who tell you that this system is working. I, 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 you know, I ask you to do that. You're not going to find it. Thank you. I thank you for coming, by the way. You know. Thank you, Mr. Barton. And I will have everyone know that Mr. Barton was one of the ones who especially reminded us that having legislators come before the board uh, is an important thing. So thank you, Mr. Barton. Mr. Harvey, do you have anything to add? Uh, moving on to line of duty benefits, as some of you may have interacted or have seen in your communities or on the news, you know, uh, the death of Mr. Wagner, uh, the police officer of Wintergreen. Um, soon after that, uh, Mr. Parr and I made a quick trip to the top of the mountain to meet with uh, the police department and see what needs there were there that we could assist with. And one of the disheartening facts that we had learned is that uh, when you die in the line of duty to protect people and you're properly and duly licensed in a similar way and fashion as our police officers, you do not get the ability to have some of the same benefits. Uh, in Mr. Wagner's case, you know, there wasn't really a lot available. Uh, for his family to take care of the mortgage and all that. Uh, line of duty benefits only extend to those who are certified in the government sector, essentially, our government agencies. Um, we thought that was a pretty big deal, because it is. Uh, when one of our own get hurt like that, we in Nelson County have a tendency to rally around them and the community as well. We don't want to see that happen to another person in the state of Virginia. The si similar instance happened in Bridgewater College when you had the shooter on campus. Uh, legislation went forward, it failed. It happened here in Wintergreen. We realized that this is not something that we wanted just to be by ourselves on, so we double, tripled down, and we got resolutions going. And for those of you, I'm sure you both have had the opportunity to see some of the resolutions in your respective districts. I believe uh, multiple counties in both of your uh, legislative uh, districts uh, have passed this resolution. Currently, from my count, that's up to about 13 jurisdiction counties and cities have passed a resolution supporting that line of duty benefits be made an option for uh, private police departments that are bona fide by the state to opt in. Um, this is a huge deal. Uh, we, we, the, the representation of this and the push has been extremely diverse this time. Uh, we have Albemarle County on board with us, uh, even as well as Appomattox, Louvanna, uh, just to name the list for the record, it's Albemarle, Nelson, Amherst, Charlotte, Montgomery, Appomattox, Augusta, Fluvanna, Madison, Green, Franklin, and Stanton. And that list continues to grow. And some of those, uh, we don't have copies yet of their resolutions beyond that list. Um, we, will be hopeful, we will be doing a press conference tomorrow with our chief of police uh, from Wintergreen, and some of their staff will be joining us, and we will have... Uh, Mr. Wagner's uh, vehicle here as well, uh, to try to get the continued push on this legislation. Currently, it is uh, Ellen Campbell. She's got the bill on the House side, and uh, Mr. Obenshane has the Senate bill. I don't believe it's out of the draft stage yet. Uh, I believe BRS still is in the draft point of this and trying to see what that needs to look like. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the committees that is going to go before is the city towns and all that, and that, that group first. So whoever's on that, whoever your ally, whoever you may know or have a relationship with, it would be critical that you try to communicate with us and we can communicate amongst uh, other localities to see what their relationships may be with them. Uh, furthermore, in that, we even had the Virginia Association of Counties add this to their legislative goals. Um, the prior time, it was not. So we have a pretty, pretty large, diverse support for that one. Uh, we hope you will join us in supporting our own. Uh, those individuals who serve on that mountaintop, I, it is without a doubt in my mind that they would, in the event Nelson County's having a crisis anywhere else, that they would come and they would serve and uh, be willing to protect the citizens of Nelson with all they got. Um, so we want, want to thank you all for being here. Those are our thoughts and concerns, feel free, outreach, email as necessary. Um, some of us do go to Richmond uh, during certain sessions. Uh, I certainly will be there multiple times, so I will look you all up and hopefully bring a posse and we can give you all a hard time, because that's our job. Um, but, uh, and also keep in mind that you all are in our thoughts and prayers, this is not an easy job. You both have a diverse demographic to represent uh, 
course, we can look at Nelson County relative to uh, Ivy is a little bit different. You know, when you're talking about Skylar versus Ivy, when you're talking about Forest to Piney River, two entirely different groups. So you maneuvering that is a hard thing. And at the same time as we want to support you in that because your success in session for these causes is the success of the community. So thank you both. If you have any other questions, I would just suggest email because we have a long uh, uh, agenda ahead of us. And uh, beyond that, look forward to interacting more. So thank you all. I want to give our legislators an applause for that. You can stick around if you want, or you can go. It's unnecessary. So, uh, moving on to the consent agenda, can we get a motion to approve the minutes and the budget amendment as presented? So moved. We have a motion from Mr. Pardo. We have a second. Second. Second from Mr. Reed. Is there any further discussion? Hearing no discussion, uh, we'll do a vote by acclamation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any objections, abstentions? Hearing none, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Moving on to presentations Blue Ridge Tunnel After Dark Event Report and Check Presentation. Heard you guys had a good time. Yeah. Mr. Smack, I see you again. Yes. I made sure I brought my other hat. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gore, for allowing us the opportunity to come here and um, make this presentation today from the proceeds from our event. Um, Nelson County Parks and Recreation and Blue Mountain Brewery are making a combined donation of the amount of $1,000 for the Nelson County Pantry made possible from proceeds from our third annual Tunnel After Dark event. This year's Tunnel After Dark event was held on Friday, October 27th. The event was co-hosted by Nelson County Parks and Recreation and Blue Mountain Brewery and it allows attendees to opt the unique opportunity to visit Nelson County's Bay and Blue Ridge Tunnel after dark. The one and a half mile section of the trail from the eastern trailhead to the western portal of the tunnel are lined with nearly 700 luminary bags to give visitors a beautiful setting as they make their walk. Along the trail, just before entering the East Portal, Blue Mountain Brewery sets up a gas fire pits, um, photo opportunities, lounging area, and a mobile bar to <clears throat> serve their flagship beers, Dark Hollow, and its annual reserve barrel age version, Concealed Darkness. Each of these beers showcase the western portal of the tunnel on the logo, which also helps promote the tunnel year round. This year's event brought in over 300 visitors who had the opportunity to attend by purchasing premium on-site parking passes or off-site shuttle tickets departing from Rockwich Valley Fire Department. Tickets sold out in, one, in under one week for this year's event. Actual attendance were 108 shuttle riders and 56 on-site cars, totaling about an average of three and a half riders per vehicle, bringing the estimated total number of visitors to 304. Um, proceeds from this year's event um, for Nelson County Parks and Recreation and Blue Mountain Brewery um, allowed us to hit the $1,000 donation mark to the Nelson County Pantry. In addition to monetary donations, we collected non-perishable food items on site totaling 150.4 pounds of food, um, which was donated to the pantry as well. We look forward to this event each year and are proud to support a local organization just in time for their busiest time of the year during the holidays. Um, today we have Taylor Smack from Blue Mountain Brewery and Mary Dixon from the Nelson County Pantry. All right, <laughs> thousand bucks. It. There we go. <laughs> Great. So, good. Huh? Yeah, do you, you want to move like, forward? Do you want to go ahead and get in the middle. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, That's a great Thank you guys. <laughs> awesome. And you know, Marion's been working the food bank for a very long time and has been an extremely important servant. So, Marion, thank you for all the hard work that you do at the food bank. I can't tell you the countless number of constituents that I have that go through there that often reference the importance of those meals. And we hope you, we appreciate you and we uh, look forward to many more years of Food bank, so. We're serving about 800 people every month. We distribute over 30,000 pounds of food every month. We have 130 volunteer average donating 400 hours of their time every month. Yep. 
Thank you, Marion. Very grateful for the community. Great. Thank you. All right, moving on to uh, the VDOT report. Robert. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, not a lot to report this time. We uh, we are still doing working on the structural replacement up on Route 633, Brundell Holler. Uh, that has been a challenge. We had some issues up there, but we are nearing completion, so we should have that dead end road open, uh, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Um, we are cutting brush on Route 29 and multiple routes throughout the county. Some of the stuff right down the guardrails where, where you can have better sight distance when you come up to these intersections. Uh, our trash contractor is scheduled to pick up trash in Nelson County. They're in Amherst County right now, and they should be moving to Nelson as soon as they pick, get to Amherst. That's 29, 56, 151. They will hit those routes and a few other routes. We did have a snow event. Sunday night, early Monday morning, uh, we crews did mobilize pretty heavily. Uh, we did put out uh, chemicals and mixed abrasives up in the higher elevations. And it was quite a bit up in Marabella, uh, up in Reeds Gap. Uh, I think it was four to six inches on top of the mountain. So with that being said, I don't have really any other, any other uh, items to report on. Great. Uh, Ms. Park. Mr. Reed. Mr. Harvey. Mr. Barton. No. What? I think he did have that signed in Ty River that we talked about. Did you get that straight? He was still working on it. All right. And uh, I did not talk to our traffic engineers uh, before I come to this meeting. Okay. They know that that is a hot issue for Nelson County. Uh, and I hope they have something soon. That's they great. Have, they, they have finished, should be finalizing it. But. Um. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, one more thing. Uh, the Whipper Wheel, you got my email on that. Can you email Ms. Robinette and I the details? Yeah, I, I looked the, at Whipper Wheel. You looked at Whipper Wheel? I've, I've been studying Whipper Wheel. I mean, either way, it's got to be right, you know, it's got to be right away there. We researched the abandonment or discontinuance back from years ago. Yeah. But basically, for that road to come back in, Chairman, it will have to be a revenue sharing project. Yes, yeah, if you could just provide the details as you have prior. And the same, and I also looked at, I think some one of you, might have been you, asked me to look at uh, Hilltop. You asked me to look at Hilltop. Yeah, yeah. Hilltop, right. And that is the same, that is really the only only vehicle we have for getting roads into this. Sure. Bringing them back in the system, unless it is a new, a new subdivision or subdivision built to current standards. Sure. Got it. I have no other questions at this time. Okay. Uh, and then you did get my email. Sorry, I said I do. Uh, about the intersection down here on Front Street. Yes, the the, <clears throat> the four way stop. Correct. I have <clears throat> again. I have I've asked our traffic engineers to Study. review that intersection and make a recommendation. Um, I don't know what they'll do. You they'll look at the crash data. But certainly, uh, you know, there is a site distance, uh, yeah, site distance restriction there. Sure. But I think the crash data, if, if, if there's much crash data there, they, they, they may consider it. Yeah. Uh, and then, is there an, I don't know what the requirements are for pedestrian crossing with the painted lines in between those intersections. At, at this time, now that the Heart of Nelson has a little bit more high traffic, people are parking in various different locations, including the uh, Lovingston Farmers Market. Is there an opportunity that maybe we could get a designated pedestrian crossing spot there? It is. The painted lines. You, the biggest thing, you they have to be, um, if it's in the curb and gutter section, we mark it a pedestrian crossing. It has to be ADA compliant, which means we have to do some reconstruction in most most places. Okay. Well, let's meet up sometime over yeah. there with some of our constituents. Yeah. Not, and that's not out of the question. That, that's yeah. not... Saying that, that can be done, it's just that has to be in place before you put yeah. it in. I mean, that's a dangerous place for 50 years. It could be a hill. You, yeah, you can't you really see. think you can see, but you, you can't. can't. You can't, especially if you're crossing as a person. I mean, you well, know. 
Let, let's look at it sometime. Okay, shoot me an email and we'll, we'll correspond. Okay. Great, thank you, Robert. Thank you. Any other further questions? Hearing none, thank you, sir. Uh, update on deck capacity, Davenport. And I can't remember. Yes, we have Ben Wilson here ben from Wilson. Davenport to uh, present an update on our deck capacity. Good afternoon. I think I might move this over here. If that's get, right. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Well, thank you all for having me again. Uh, as Candy said, my name is Ben Wilson. I work with Davenport & Company and we serve as financial advisor to the county. Um, you all have seen this presentation a couple times. We just wanted to give you an update since it's been a little while since we've been here. Uh, projects are still sort of evolving. We're having those conversations with staff, uh, but we just wanted to sort of bring this back to the front of mind because it's something that's, that's in development as we go. So. Uh, there are page numbers in the bottom right that I'm going to refer to. Let's see if this one. Sure. Maybe not. Here, Mark. I got three of them all wrong. Oh, you got three? I think we already have one. Yeah. We'll just start on page two. Um, that's not working, so we'll just leave up the page there. But yeah, so we've given this presentation, like I said, a couple of times in the past, December of 21, March of 22, and most recently this past February. Um, basically what we're looking at here is the capacity uh, and the affordability of adding additional debt to the, the county's uh, profile for projects that are being developed right now. Um, we have made some adjustments since February, just based on the market, based on having some more knowledge about the projects we're looking at. And uh, you'll see on the coming pages sort of those adjustments that we've made. So if we can flip to page three, this is just meant to give you an update of the assumptions that we're making in this analysis. Uh, the baseline that we're looking at is $57 million worth of projects that includes a land purchase uh, the DSS building that's being uh, really at the beginning of the design phase right now, uh, the school renovation project for about $25 million, and then we have sort of a placeholder of $19.5 million for other projects that might be considered in, in the near future. Uh, there is a second scenario we've looked at here, which provides another $18 million of capacity for the county uh, if there are other projects that want to be considered. Uh, as you can see, we're looking at mostly 25 to 30 year debt here. Uh, with tax exempt interest rates, that we are looking at about a 5% rate right now. If you were to go out and borrow funds right now, it would most likely come in below that. Uh, but again, these are planning interest rates. We don't want to get too aggressive with those. Uh, we're also looking at a taxable interest rate of about 6%. That'll be That'll just depend on what these projects end up being. So there's sort of a mix of five and 6% in here, uh, and sort of the way that the projects end up shaking out will ultimately determine where those interest rates land. Now we would, did wanna give some perspective because we have increased those assumptions since we originally did this. We can flip to page five now. These are two yield curves that we look at very regularly in uh, municipal finance. On the left side in green there, that's what we call the MMD, the Municipal Market Data Yield Curve, and that's essentially a loan of one years on the very far left, all the way out to a loan of 30 years. These are what interest rates look like right now. That dark green line is where we stand as of last week. Uh, those dotted lines below are the periods of time that we looked at this analysis previously. So you can see that gray dotted line at the very bottom, that's when we started this analysis about two years ago. Our interest rates were much lower than they are now. Uh, like I mentioned, we've made some adjustments to make up for that. The right side, the treasury yield curve, that's sort of what taxable debt is based off of. So we provided that for perspective as well. Same trend that we see on the tax exempt side, much lower when we first started looking at this analysis. And today we're in the four to 5% range on the taxable side. Just flipping to the next page, the next two pages really are just to provide some perspective on where these rates have been historically versus where they are now. As you can see that 
brown dotted line is where treasury rates are as of last week. The green dotted line is where tax exempt MMD rates were last week. Uh, and you can see that they're about the midway point of where they've been the past 25 years or so. Uh, we saw some pretty historic lows back in 2020 and 2021 not anything that we've seen in decades. Uh, and there's not a huge expectation that we might get back to that level. Um, but you can see that the trend over the last couple of years has been upward. Uh, now that can change on a dime, uh, depending on what happens in the economy and what the Federal Reserve chooses to do. Uh, but just so you can see, there has been an upward trend over the last couple of years. And page seven is just looking at the last two years, how the rates fared. And there has been a little bit of variability, but overall we've gone up. So just moving into the actual analysis that we've done for, for Nelson, if we look at page nine, these pages are gonna look very familiar. We haven't made a ton of changes to how we set this up, but the baseline analysis we looked at was that $57 million. That includes the DSS building, some schools, and then a little bit more capacity for other projects if there are any. Uh, what we did look at is that there's the current budget, the county's fiscal 2024 budget, uh, has about $3.3 .3 million in it for debt service. And what has been contemplated in the past and the expectation going forward is that budget will be about $3.9 million in 2025 and beyond. And that's an important assumption in this analysis because it wouldn't work without the, that change in 2025. Uh, and you'll see on the next couple pages, the way this is set up is because the debt service would be a lot higher in the first couple years, or a lot lower in the first couple years, and then you'd have a couple years where it peaks, uh, we would essentially take some revenues from those earlier surpluses that we would be projecting, use that the, in the years where the debt service peaks uh, to allow you to have a little bit more capacity than you would have had otherwise. And you can see that on page 10. Here you've got in brown your existing debt service. So this is principal plus interest, what you're paying on the debt that you already have. That's what's in brown there. So starting in 2024, it drops off a little bit and it drops again after 2028. That light green is the debt service for the $57 million worth of projects that are contemplated here. And essentially, like I said, uh, in 2025, there's expected to be a little a bit of a surplus there that you can add to your fund balance and use over the next couple years after that to be able to afford the debt in the years where your existing debt sort of overlaps with the new debt. Um, and this is, this is nothing new. This is what we've talked about each time we've been here before. Um, just a strategy to allow you to essentially take advantage of the, these, uh, these revenues earlier than you would have otherwise. Page 11, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. There are a lot of numbers there, uh, but essentially this right here is the, the numbers behind the graph on the prior page. We start with a fund balance on the left. You have that debt service budget that I mentioned about 3.9 million in 2025 and beyond. Total revenues adding up in column D your existing debt service in E, and then that projected debt service in F. And you can see that we're gonna use that fund balance uh, in column H going forward. Now on page 12, this is where we layer in that $18 million to get to a round number of 75. Now that may not be where you want to end up based on the revenues that would be required to do that, um, but this is just to provide some perspective to get to that extra 18 million where you have in total 75 million to work with, uh, it would require another $1.4 million of revenues starting in 2027 and beyond. Now, we haven't made any assumptions on what those revenues would be, if they're real estate tax, uh, occupancy tax, whatever they are, we've made no assumption on that end, just a, a generic $1.4 million for these purposes. and. That 1.4 million allows you to go out and get that additional 18 million of projects. Now this has the same concept as the prior scenario we were looking at on page 13. Uh, you can see the graph again. You still have the brown existing, 
the light green for the 57 million, and then the blue at the top is where we've layered in that extra 18 million. And you can see again, there's going to be a sur expected to be a surplus in 2025. That, along with the existing debt service fund balance, would be used in those those years around 28 to 31 uh, in order to afford the debt in, in those years where it's much higher. And again, looking at page 14 here, just the numbers behind that graph. I'm not going to go through these, but the numbers are there if, you, if you'd like to dig into it in more detail or if you have any questions. Uh, Andy and Linda can certainly pass those on to us. Now, the last section here we're looking at is the ratios that we typically see in uh, municipal finance. And the first one on page 16 is what we call debt to assess value. So this is saying your tax base, your assessed value is where you get a majority of your revenue. That's a basis for a lot of the rating agencies, lenders, VRA to see how much debt you could potentially take on. Um, you can see in, on the right side there in 2023, uh, that debt to assess value, so the amount of debt you have outstanding as a percentage of your tax base is about half a percent. Uh, that would be considered very strong by Moody's, which is one of the rating agencies uh, that, that rates local government debt. And if we layer on the 57 million or the 75 million, that, that number would go up to 2.2% or 2.8%. And you can, you can see compared to others in Virginia and the region as well as nationally, uh, that although those levels would be a little bit higher as your tax base grows, this, this ratio actually changes a little bit. And if the tax base continues to grow, the debt's not just gonna grow on its own. Um, so those might look a little bit more favorable as we look at them in the next couple years. Um, one thing to point out here on the national side, it may look like those national uh, AAA, AA, single A rated entities look a lot better than Virginia and you all, um, but that's because most places in the U.S. don't have the school debt underneath sort of their umbrella. So you all are paying for school debt. And that's what happens throughout Virginia. Rating agencies, VRA, lenders, they know that. Um, so even though those Virginia numbers and yours are a little bit higher than the national ones, uh, th that's nothing to be concerned about because, again, most places have independent school districts or different levels of government uh, to, to deal with schools as opposed to what we do in Virginia. Um, one thing to consider here is to potentially put a policy in place um, that's looked upon very favorably by lenders, by the rating agencies, uh, and the range that we would typically see a policy like this is in that three and a half to four percent range. Now, that's not to say that you couldn't technically go over that, but it's it's signaling to lenders and the rating agencies that you all are paying attention to this stuff and that you have a plan in place going forward. Now, the next page is debt service as a percentage of expenditures. So this is how much of your budget is going towards paying principal and interest on, on debt. Uh, again, on the right side, you can see that right now in 2023, Nelson is about 6.6%. That compares very favorably to all of the, the other entities that we're looking at here. Excuse me. With the addition of the 57 million, that would put you at about 8.2%. And the 75 million is about 11%. Uh, at the current level, uh, S&P, which is another one of those rating agencies, uh, would view your uh, burden here as very strong. Um, even with the 57 million, you just barely get into that strong range. So you all are in very good shape from this ratio's perspective as well. Um, this might be another policy that you might wanna consider putting in place uh, perhaps at the 10 to 12% range, which would be considered a strong policy. Now the last page, uh, we're just looking at what are our next steps here. Um, the projects are still in development, um, sort of as they become more clear, uh, this can be refined even further. Um, what we've talked about with staff in preparation for potentially having to go out and borrow funds for these projects in the future is one those financial policies that we talked about putting some ratios in place uh, not just on the debt side but 
potentially on the fund balance side as well to sort of give guardrails that you may already follow, but just to formalize them, again, to show lenders and the rating agencies that, um, that you all are on top of this, which you are because you have this company that can update this regularly. Um, the other thing to consider would be to potentially obtain a credit rating. Um, it's not uncommon for a county like you all to, to go out and get a credit rating and, and borrow in the public markets because there's a couple different ways you could access funding. One of those is through a state program like Virginia Resources Authority, Virginia Public School Authority, but the, the difficulty there is that there are restrictions on what projects they could fund. And if you're going out to, to try to fund a school and the DSS building at the same time, VRA is not gonna let you do that because they don't allow you to fund schools through their program. And BPSA is not gonna allow you to fund the DSS building because they only do schools. Um, so going out and obtaining a credit rating could position you very favorably to be able to issue bonds on the public markets under the Nelson County name uh, and still get very favorable interest rates that are fairly similar to what you would see with VRA and BPSA. Um, now the other avenue here would be to go to a bank and try to get a loan from them. Uh, what we're seeing with banks right now though is that they are not particularly interested in anything longer than 10 or 15 years. Um, and what we've been running in here is, is 25 to 30 years. Um, so to be able to get those payments down to a level that's manageable for the county, we would need to go out to those, those longer maturities, which you can do through VRA and BPSA. Um, but you have a lot more flexibility if you were to go out and do it as the county um, under the Nelson County name. Um, so that's something, if it's something that interests you, uh, we could provide some more information on the policies that we can help develop the document for that. Um, and then we could also help you all figure out a, a strategy with the credit rating agencies um, to potentially obtain a rating for, or more than one rating for the county. Um, so that's just something to think about. We're not asking for any action today, um, but it's something we'll continue to have conversations with staff about, and if it's something that you all are interested in, we can certainly push forward in that direction. Great. Any questions for uh, Mr. Wilson at this time? Um, yeah, I do have a question. Yes, sir. So, um, Mr. Wilson, does this debt capacity report make any assumptions on whether we as a county would be eliminating our land use taxation or implementing a gross sales tax? It does not. Um, so if there, if there are any additional revenues that are available that could change this, uh, really that second scenario does assume that there are going to be additional revenues available. So if you were to try to get to that $75 million level, um, if there were projects to fill that, um, there would need to be additional revenues of some sort. I mean, at a very base level, you could just adjust the budget, but that's not going to be possible. So um, if, if there is another revenue source like that, it is factored into the second analysis, but the $57 million just assumes that the budget stays constant at a 2025 level, about $3.9 million. That's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. Yes, sir. Um, so, um, if we do have additional revenues, we would have to either pull those through the budget from the general fund or uh, target them for debt service and put in the debt services. Right? That if, if, if you were to need more than the 57 million, again, the 57 million currently fits within the, the budget at that $3.9 million level. If you were to want to exceed that, that 57 million, yes, you would need to divert revenues from general fund operations to debt service. So is there any reason to increase debt service reserve to change some of these ratios and the payouts and things like that? Well, that does get factored into, so the, the ratios themselves, that debt service has a percentage of expenditures, that does take into account the debt service. I didn't realize that was where you're going with that question, but yes, we, we include that in the denominator. So even if the revenues are coming in the general fund and being spent on debt service, we would still include that as part of the county's budget as a whole. Okay, any other questions for Ms. Wilson at this time? Candy. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to 
to remind the board that um, the 3.9 million includes an ongoing uh, contribution of $610,000, um, resuming in FY25. Um, the board decided to forego that contribution to the debt service fund in FY24. But in order to make this analysis work as presented, we would need to resume that in FY25 and carry it forward throughout the, the, um, the plan. Sure. Any other questions? And I, you know, this, I'm not sure what all goes in and what the cost implications are for obtaining a credit rating. I mean, you know, is that, is, I guess that's the government's version of getting a credit report and being able to. Yeah, there would be some upfront costs on that. Um, if, if you were to do it as a part of actually issuing debt. How long is it good for? A year? It, it's, it's pretty much good indefinitely. I mean, sure. they, usually what we do and something that we've done that we did with Campbell County, um, over the last several years is we went and got a credit rating with them before they were actually gonna issue the debt because they knew that they had big projects right. coming up. And that was a big middle school. And uh, we recently helped them borrow for Brookville High School as well. They're doing a renovation there. Um, but we went and got the credit rating before the debt. So there was a cost up front to that. Um, and then when they went back to actually issue the debt, you have to go back to the rating agencies, give them an update, what has happened since we last talked to you, uh, and at that point, they would rate the debt itself. Um, so if you were to go out and get that credit rating, it would be good for pretty much as long as you're willing to cooperate with the rating agencies to give them the information they need to keep up their analysis, which after the initial work is not no. anything major. That's just more informational, just yeah. curious. Uh, I got one more thing. Um, uh, you mentioned considering impl implementing uh, passing financial policies. Yes. Um, and um, I, th I, th I think you inferred that it, it shows that we are serious, but does that, because we already have a pretty strong credit rating, do you expect that that would increase our chances anywhere in terms of either being able to get funding or or is it or is it more an internal it's it's not going to make or break anything but it is viewed favorably and it will help pro potentially produce a, a better rating than you would have gotten without them um, we recommend it um, because again it sh show and you all have a, a strong management team and you all are on top of everything but it shows them, people that aren't gonna come and stand in front of you and see you interact with your constituents and see you interact with staff, it helps them see that you are serious about it, like you said, but also that you're on top of it and you're paying attention to your debt and you're not just going out and borrowing. But in addition to that, if we were to do any of those things, it would um, make our long-term intentions clear to our constituents as well in terms of what we're trying to do. Yes. So it may actually have more of effect internally mm -hmm. than yep. in terms of trying Absolutely. To and I, it, it, it really does sort of lay out a groundwork for moving forward if, because you all are obviously not going to be on the board forever. Um, it establishes something that boards in the future can, can go back to and, um, and sort of measure themselves against as well. But they, of course, can be revisited. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, and we also, most of the time, we include language that says this isn't a firm restriction. Like, you can, you are able to go above this if you have a plan yeah. to come back in compliance, that kind of thing. It's, it's a guideline, not a requirement, per se. All right. Any other questions? Hearing none, we will move on in the agenda. Ben, thank you for thank making you. the trip out here. Um, I'm sure we'll be calling on you even more over into the next budget section. Uh, Larkin Property Master Plan, Architecture Partners. Okay. Um, we have Jim Vernon and Gary Harvey from Architectural Partners here to um, present their latest work on the Larkin uh, Master Plan. PowerPoint presentation. If not, we can move forward as well. Thirty-five. 
Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, administrators, we once again thank you for having us uh, with you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Harvey. Uh, I'm the principal and senior architect with Architectural Partners. And with me I have Jim Byrne, one of our senior architects. Uh, we're going to revisit with you uh, briefly just a little bit of the history of how we've uh, arrived at this point. And then I'm going to turn it over to Jim. He's going to give you some additional data based off of the request at our last uh, work session that we had. So uh, just uh, over a year ago, I'm sorry, uh, just over a year ago, the uh, county purchased approximately 312 acres from the Larkin Estate. Um, this site that we are talking about is uh, almost directly behind the high school and middle school and extends from the south side of Drumheller Orchard Lane to the north side of uh, Stevens Cove Road. Um, we have been working with uh, the, the board and the county administration as well as Parks and Rec for the past uh, year or so. Um, we've had several work sessions um, and we have explored um, approximately six different concepts on how best to utilize the site. And ultimately through working with the board, um, Parks and Rec and the administration, we have arrived at uh, the one master plan that we have on the screen today. Um, this master plan focuses on all recreational uses um, and locates them mainly in the center of the site uh, for several reasons. One being, of course, it's much closer to the school and provides access directly from the school to, to the uh, recreation areas. And it also leaves the north and south areas free to be determined at a later date for any other potential uses. Um, whereas before we were um, showing more of a conceptual um, components to you at, at, uh, on the board uh, and during the, the various components that we showed you. We're now uh, refining and honing in the components and they're actually to scale so you can actually start to see how the site is being able to be um, fully, fully utilized. So a brief description of some of the components and we're going to move uh, again from, from sort of a uh, north to south uh, uh, vantage point. So we have included a maintenance shed um, in site for a forestry building, and that's going to be close to uh, Drumheller's Orchard Lane. Uh, we have developed uh, baseball and softball fields as well as multi-purpose sports fields, and those are along with uh, additional support buildings, uh, which would include restrooms, concessions, press box, um, some storage areas and associated parking. We have various picnic pavilions of different sizes to accommodate different types of events. We have a playground area. We have an outdoor pool and splash park uh, with the uh, required supporting uh, pool buildings. And we have an outdoor basketball court uh, with three outdoor pickleball courts. And these were some of the items that were mentioned by Parks and Rec that were desirable. Um, as indicated on the master plan is the location for a future phase for an indoor recreation facility. This would be a Y uh, type building with multiple courts, multi-purpose rooms for gymnastics, aerobics, uh, different types of exercise programs, and an indoor track, climbing walls, and the potential for an indoor year-round pool. Um, this is dashed in on the site plan, um, and that would be indicated for a future part of the project. Also indicated on the site plan um, is a blue uh, geometric shape to indicate the possibility of developing a reservoir of some sort along Dillard Creek Basin. Um, whether or not this is, is feasible is being uh, analyzed by another consultant. Um, and we would await uh, their reporting on that. Um, at the end of our last work session, we presented an overall estimate cost for all of the above, and then we were challenged by this group um, with the task of coming back to the board with the answer to this question. What could be developed for $15 million? So what we're gonna cover today is um, a breakdown of what we would project that you could do with um, up to three different scenarios with the cost estimate.
So a few points to make before presenting those uh, cost estimate options. Uh, first of all, we've taken that uh, future indoor rec center shown dashed on the site plan down to the bottom right of the green fields. Uh, we've taken that off the table for the time being. If that were built out uh, with a full program, it'd be a $30 million plus project, years in the making. And the, the board's very clear direction has been to, yes, plan for the future, but identify and pursue recreational benefits that the residents of Nelson County can enjoy uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, secondly, we have uh, nothing in our cost estimates uh, for the uh, potential reservoir. Again, that's a separate effort even to determine whether it's possible, and so uh, there's no way for us to put a dollar amount on that yet. Now, if you went, every, if you went forward with everything that's on the plan that's not dashed, if you did it all at once in today's dollars, it would be a $36 million construction project. Whereas the uh, budget that was put forth hypothetically for us to uh, consider was $15 million. So uh, one of the first things to say is that uh, you could easily spend that entire $15 million on infrastructure and site work on this property uh, with no money left over for a picnic table. It would be for roads to be DOT standards, utilities clearing, site work, seeding restoration, stormwater management, etc. So that's obviously not a very attractive way to go, and it might put some shoulders on a road to park on and some trails, but there's, there's no um, lack of beautiful hiking trails in Nelson County. So then, in order to provide some tangible benefit now with the budget, hypothetical budget at hand, it means we have to phase development. In other words, put some of the infrastructure in, some of the amenities in, and move both those things forward in a Pachisi-like way. So this takes prioritizing. The, the options are endless. There are many, many ways to cut the $15 million pie. And our goal today is that out of the, the discussion of options at A, B, and C, which we presented, we can get some direction forward for a consensus budget to go with the consensus plan and a, a way forward with the property for the benefit of Nelson County. So if you look now at option A, and I'll make a few comments first of all that pertain to option A, option B, and option C. So for each option, we have all the potential components of what we're calling phase one. That's the far left column. And you can see that goes from water and sewer at the top down to mobilization and general conditions at the bottom. So this is a list of all the components that we're saying could be a part of phase one. And then the construction estimate, that is the next column, uh, indicates their entire 100% estimated cost. And so if you take that second column from the left, construction estimate, you add up all those numbers, that's where you see we arrived at the $36 million figure, which is if you wanted to do everything that was shown on the phase one master plan. So that's not the goal. The goal is what can we do for $15 million? And so what we began to do is prioritize. And so underneath each option, is a brief summary at the top of the page, right underneath the bold title, that says what option A is all about, uh, what is prioritized in option A. You can read there, option A prioritizes site work, infrastructure, utilities, roads to 75%. So this doesn't bring the roads up to DTO standards, but it gets everybody onto the site, roads that are usable for visitors, for those coming to use the amenities. Limited parking, one multi-purpose field, completed splash pad to give the water activity, a partial playground, uh, not the full playground, and picnic sites only, no pavilions, no hard surface courts, no maintenance facilities, rented portable restrooms. So you can see we've kind of been through a process like you might be if you build a house. Well, yes, we can afford that. No, we can't do that. We're going to give this priority. We're going to put that out, out for later. And so again, option A gives you a, a bit of the cake and something to bite on also. And how did we do that? So the third column from the left uh, shows how we spent, uh, in theory, 75% uh, of the water and sewer budget, 75% of utilities, 75% of seeding, restoration, etc. 25% of the cost of fields gives you that one field, uh, no money spent on a maintenance building. 5% uh, of the budget for outdoor pool facility and splash pad gives you the splash pad and then on down the line. So, it's a series of decisions. Yes to this, no to that, a little bit of this, a little bit of 
of that, and it comes out down at the bottom of the fourth column, which says phase one estimate, it comes out to 15 million. And there are notes on the right that give a little more information about what the implications are for each of those decisions. Any questions about the layout or the presentation of strategy? This is for option A. Option A. All right. So then option B said, well, what if we said we wanted to put in all the roads to DDOT standards? And then uh, DDOT can take uh, responsibility for these as a benefit to the county. What if we prioritize that? And so uh, uh, you go down the left-hand column until you get to roads, and you see 100% percentage. And you see the cost of that. What, what's the implication of having that priority? Uh, at the top, underneath the title, all roads completed to DDOT standards. No playground. Site work at the structure utility 75% complete. We still have one multi purpose field. We still have a completed splash pad. We still have picnic sites only, no pavilions, no hard surfaces, no maintenance facilities, rented portable restrooms. So the trade off for full DDOT standards uh, has to do with picnic pavilions and playgrounds. <coughs> but again, it's like a menu at a restaurant where we pick and choose and say, well, let's. Let's see how the math turns out. We've got a spreadsheet set up, so a million ways to do it. Any questions about that priority? Not asking for yay or nay, but how we arrived at the numbers. <coughs> All right, and moving quickly. Option C says, what if we make the outdoor pool uh, the priority? And so we have a completed outdoor pool facility with a support building. That will be concessions, pool offices, uh, lifeguard training facility, restrooms, locker rooms, equipment storage, all of that. Uh, but no multi-purpose field, no playgrounds, no picnic area, no maintenance facilities. We would have some site work, some infrastructure, utility, and roads at various stages of completion. So we're not really here with answers as much as to show uh, implications of choosing priorities. Option A being a little bit of everything, option B being DDOT standards for roads, and option C being we want to have a completed uh, pool facility for Nelson County. What's the trade-off? So that's a quick, very quick overview. And again, uh, what we, we're working at your schedule. We're not here asking for answers or direction, but we wanted to respond to your request as you ask us the question, well, what can we do for 15 million? And the answer is it depends on what you prioritize. And we're here for questions and response if there are some. Any questions at this time? Just Mark. curious, how difficult, how difficult would it be to have three different scenarios of this highlighting the different options? Uh, not difficult at all. It's just a matter of graphics. We've got it all in the CAD program, and we can do that. That'd it, be a nice what, visual to have. Right. It's going to be hard to see, uh, but we'll, we can add notes. You know, a road that's shown, is it shown is to PDOT uh, right. standards, or is it uh, uh, a gravel surface, or is it uh, somewhat but, but the absence of the other things. Yes, yes. That'd be very easy yeah. to do, and we can do that. And we'll do that if that's helpful. And, and, of course, uh, you could come back with option uh, D and say, look, we've got to have public restrooms. That needs to be the first thing on the site. Or we've got to have a maintenance building. And those things can't be taken off the table right away. So we, we have all the flexibility in the world to develop as many options as you see fit. I'm glad to respond. All right. Mr. Barton, did you have a question? Are, are we taking this time to discuss what our priorities? Are we doing that? Or are we is this the time for that? We're at your disposal and here for questions and certainly willing to work with you in any way you want. I think Mr. Parr had indicated segregating for the costs. I think that was one. Well, Separating I, I, some of the costs. Yeah, I, li I listened to it. I, you know, I strongly feel that, you know, we've spent a lot of money on uh, this land. And we tend to spend a lot of money on a recreation facility. And, 
and I think it's important that 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 the people of Nelson County receive the benefit from this. What would they? What, why would they feel really good about what we have? You know, and um, uh, you know what we talked about before. I mean, where this is is beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing, and and then we have a. Uh, uh, a recreation facility for all the people of Nelson County. Uh, where do we start? I, I really believe the place we need to start is swimming area. There, there, there's all sorts of reasons for that, you know, and and um, and then from there we can build, you know, further and further. Um, like, you know, this is. You know, I, I believe that. I, I believe that the, the people of Dallas County, when they realize the benefits <coughs> that they will accrue from a place that they can bring their children and enjoy their grandchildren and meet with their neighbors, a, a picnic table, they can do that in the backyard, you know. And, and, and I, I understand the need for fields, but we have some fields. We need more fields. We, we need to pay for these things. But, you know, I, I, as a person who remembers Van Rikers and Lake Nelson and, and, and knows how difficult it is to get to the rivers of Nelson County, you know, people believe, I, you know, just go, that, that, that's not the case. I, I, I feel that in terms of, to be perfectly honest, it would enhance our community and bring us closer together as a people, all of us. And so, uh, you know, I, 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 I expressed pa passion before for the schools. I, I, my passion is for the people of Nelson County, and I, I really do think that, that that you need to figure out a way, not a splash park. We need a place where people can picnic, swim, learn to swim. That's what we need, really. You know, I mean, and, and I mean that—that's what I believe. I—I I believe it strongly. I have really nothing else to say. And they go off into the wilderness. <laughs> right. I think uh, that has been heard, and that was the reason for option C to say pool is the party, and here is the way it can be done with this budget that has been studied. Right. Well, they put me at the opposite end of the table for a reason. <laughs> um, option C was the first one I ruled out, sorry. But it was the first one I was looking at these. It was, I'm 100% option A. Um, it gives us a little bit of everything. And I know we're not voting on this today, but I'm just saying to, to counter the, the conversation, um, it gives good infrastructure, 75% complete with um, site work and roads, utilities. Um, gives us a little bit for everybody. You know, we've got some water activities. Yes, it's a splash pad. We've got some park playground. We've got some picnic areas. Um, I just, I, I like option A just because it gives a little bit of everything and gives us good infrastructure rather than, um, you know, going down a dirt road to get to the out behind the high school, which, you know, um, very little bit of that infrastructure work can be accomplished with that budget in option C. But that's just, that's me. That, that was the intention of option A. Yeah, a little bit of everything going forward. forward. Right. Uh, Candy, did you have something to say? Um, I was just going to suggest that um, possibly look at a separate work session to delve into these details a little more further. Um, if you have any questions um, or suggestions for additional data that our potential partners might provide us um, in order to facilitate that discussion, um, now would be the time or we can um, get your thoughts uh, after today's meeting and, and try to schedule something um, where we're just focused on this. Yeah. Definitely the visuals. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I think this has been really useful. 
Um, you piece this together with our debt service analysis that we just had. Um, we've got two pieces of a very important puzzle we're trying to put together. Um, we have other capital needs in the county that are not on the part of the Larkin property, so that's another piece of this as well that we can address in a, in a work session. Um, and then really, um, I, I think that um, we're probably pretty close at uh, putting something, moving something forward, but we don't know yet what that's gonna be. Um, the other question that I have that doesn't show up with any of these Larkin estimates are the recurring costs of maintaining and staffing and all those other kind of things, which is another, um, which as a recurring cost, it is something that affects our budget in ways that debt service doesn't and capital payments and things like that. So, um, uh, you know, we're close at having more information to be able to move forward at this time. I just, I wanted to let you know um, how useful this is because we kind of arbitrarily picked the amount of money that you had to play with because it would give us a point of reference and now we've got that. And now we can, we can really see our way clearly to perhaps come up with, um, you know, a development schedule for the county as opposed to just for a lot of And it leaves an additional 4.4 million in that debt capacity, assuming the 57 million dollar figure. This 15, there's 19.4. Yeah. You're marked here for balance of projects, so that leaves another 4.4 for other. I do concur with the Mr. Reed and Mr. Parr. Uh, I, I do like, uh, I do believe that we, some further discussion is going to be needed. Um, obviously, we, we do retreats, and of course, we have a new board coming up, so it's probably going to be ideal that we probably visit doing something similar to that uh, to also discuss other capital needs that we may have on the upcoming. Uh, I guess we haven't done one in what, a couple of years, right? So, it's probably something we're going to need to visit. Um, I do appreciate this. I, I, I do err on the side of if we're going to do a road, let's make it to VDOT standard, then we don't have to worry about it. Um, and it's kind of their problem for a good degree in the maintenance of that. Uh, you know, the, the question just comes down to with, you know, how much debt capacity is the board, does the board have an appetite to take on? Um, you know, we we as a county are very proud of our AAA rating, essentially, with the Moody's, and that's something that uh, we take a lot of pride in. And the people of Nelson should also, but at the same time, as there are needs in this community that has to be utilized and has to be uh, uh, dispersed. You know, we have a new high school on the horizon that we're going to be taking care of, and more needs arise beyond that. So, uh, does that kind of give you an indication of where we need to go? Separate meeting. Yes, other than uh, determining when that might be. Sure, and it'd probably be wise. We'll wait until we get a new board. We'll discuss that timing. Um, I would like to add this really quickly. Um, you know, the board does have at its disposal some non-recurring funds that you could potentially um, utilize if you so desire to add some of these amenities um, that aren't overly expensive, relatively speaking. Sure. So that, that's something to and, consider as well. And that could come out. And You're not necessarily um, borrow money for. Sure. Everything here. Yep. Um, one thing that I forgot to ask, uh, is our debt capacity going to have any play with the jail system? No. Uh, that debt is falls under the jails. So that would not reflect capacity. on us at all. That's right. I think it we, does we've not. talked this before. Um, however, it is a, a recurring financial obligation of the county. Sure. Or will be. Okay. Um, let's read. Yeah, one, one question that I have moving forward, it doesn't really pertain to you, maybe we should let you sit down and we can talk about, you know, our internal stuff. Very good. Yeah, have a seat. Well, thank you all. If anybody has no more questions, then we'll let them go. And in the meantime, we'll respond to Mr. Parr's request. We'll provide sure. a great graphic representation of each of the options for you to attach to the... Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reed. So, my question... Uh, to Candy and to the board is, um, you know, we'll be coming up against our budget session really soon once uh, once once we have our new board, um, and um, 
you know, chicken egg here. Which would be more important to have done first? Should we do, you know, capital not knowing exactly what our budget's going to be, or do budget not knowing exactly what our capital? You know, do you understand the dilemma? Yes, but in, in terms of the debt capacity, the plan that they've laid out um, allows for capital improvements up to $57 million. Um, That is with the additional $610,000 contribution annually going forward in FY25. Um, so I guess our question is, are we committed to that during the budget to make right. sure that that's going to be there? That's right. Um, without having necessarily decided what it's going to be. That's so I don't know what the board thinks about timing for that. Um, uh, I, th I think, I don't really know. I can't. I, I, I err on the side that if you, you look to revenue enhancements when you found a project that was the revenue enhancement, does that make sense? Um, I, I think it's, you know, if there's a chicken and egg, that's, that's the chicken and then the egg for me is the board says, yes, this is the amount. And if there's revenue enhancements that are needed, then that's when the board looks to how that needs to be turned out. Mm -hmm. um, but as Candy's indicated. It's sort of a concurrent process. Yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, budgetary, okay. you're going to have a lot of decisions to make. And, and one of them is, you know, if you want to have the $57 million in the ability for capital improvements, then you'll need to commit that 610000 going forward. And then balance that with all the other um, financial requests and, and uh, responsibilities of the board. So I guess we'll wait to decide if we will be having a work session before or after March. We, can, we don't have to make that decision today, but that's what's on my mind right now is right. how to piece it all before in March. Before March. I would think so. Before March. Yeah. Yeah. January, we'll mm -hmm. schedule a date. Yeah. We can do that. Um, I can't say for certain right now when the general fund budget will be ready for your review. Um, it's typically February, March time frame. Um. All right. Any other further questions? Excellent. Uh, moving on to regional transit governance study. And I know we were planning a big Zoom meeting here, but. Do we know if internet's still out? I don't know if we know for sure. They were saying midnight tonight. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely out. Didn't know if I should check to see. <laughs> the good news is that I had a little bit of a heads up and was already preparing for another presentation. The bad news is that um, I only had two hours of a heads what? up. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we'll take a recess before we get into new business, and the first thing after that will be unification. Oh, more papers. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. I have to admit, I feel like I've seen this a few times. You can let me know if I've anything. I got you. Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Sandy Shackleford. I'm the Director of Planning and Transportation for the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission. And it's great to be with you all this afternoon, seeing some familiar faces both um, on the board and, and the um, audience as well. Um, today I am going to share some information on the Regional Transit Governance Study that the TJPDC has been working through over the past year. The purpose of the presentation is to provide a little bit of information on regional efforts related to transit, review the purpose of the governance study um, that we've been working through, and then discuss some of the findings and next steps that have been identified through the study. So um, this is just to introduce the project team to you all. The project team consists of myself, Sandy Shackleford, um, our executive director, who you all are very familiar with, Christine Jacobs, and then um, Lucinda Shannon has been the project manager for the TJPDC. 
We have been working with a consultant team of AECOM to support the project, and as we um, alluded to previously, we were planning for Stephanie um, Amoni Yangson, the project manager from AECOM, to be presenting to you all via Zoom, obviously with the um, internet uh, outage currently in place here. Um, she is unable to join tonight, but um, I was already preparing to give this presentation next week, and um, we wanted to make sure that this information was before you this afternoon. Um, so before I jump into discussing the specifics of the project, I think it's important to understand the framework that led to us deciding to complete the study right now. Um, so this all started really back in 2009 when the General Assembly approved legislation that allowed for the creation of a regional transit authority. The legislation granted the transit authority powers to coordinate transit planning in the region, establish bylaws, and operate transit systems. It did not, however, provide the authority with any powers to receive direct funding, and this authority was not activated by any of the localities. In 2017, the Regional Transit Partnership was formed to create a venue, to build trust among stakeholders, to have established structure for a potential authority, and work towards better, better collaboration among all of the transit providers serving our region. The Regional Transit Partnership paved the way for two studies that were completed in 2022. The first was a feasibility study looking at what opportunities might be to um, expand transit service in Albemarle County, which led to, the, um, to a demonstration grant that was awarded to pilot microtransit in a couple portions of the county. And then the second one was the Regional Transit Vision Plan, which identified preferred transit service for all localities within our region. The Vision Plan established two transit networks, one of which was a fiscally constrained network, and the other was an unrestrained network. The assumptions for the fiscally constrained network were based on identifying additional investment from the region into transit service, and one recommendation from the Regional Transit Vision Plan was consideration of a regional transit authority. The, TJ, the TJPDC embarked on the governance study to help us understand what opportunities might look like to implement the system improvements that were identified in the Regional Transit Vision Plan. The governance study allowed us to go through a discovery process to understand how other regions with similar characteristics are undertaking regional coordination of their transit services, what approaches have been successful in the state of Virginia, and what is most likely to be permitted legislatively. This discovery process has allowed us to understand what options may be available to our region as we move forward. I want to be clear that we are not asking for any action from you all at this time, but we do want to make sure that you all are informed um, that we are undertaking this process and um, continue to engage with you as we explore next steps identified through the, through the government study. We understand that each locality has its own unique needs, and this time we want all jurisdictions throughout the region to be informed in order to continue the discussions moving forward. The two main goals that we identified for the Regional Transit Governance Study were first to identify potential governance options for regional transit, and then second to identify potential funding mechanisms to increase investment into transit throughout the region. Our discovery process included four phases. So first we needed to fully understand the existing system operations in our region. Second, we spent some time working to understand how peer transit systems operated. Our third phase included a review of potential sources of revenue to support increased funding for regional transit. And then the final phase identified governance and decision-making options. There was an extensive amount of engagement that went into the completion of this study. First, it was imperative that all of the localities in our region were represented, as well as the service operators and impacted regional stakeholders. These stakeholders met throughout the study period to hear updates and provide feedback to the TJPDC and the consultant team. We also conducted outreach with each of the existing transportation or transit authorities within the state of Virginia in order to understand the feasibility of different organizational structures, as well as communicating closely with the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation, which um, provided us a grant to complete the study, and the Virginia Department of Transportation. And this was partially to understand how statewide policies and processes would impact our opportunities. And then finally, we completed an analysis of six different peer regions throughout the nation. These were regions that had similar characteristics to ours, which allowed us to understand a range of possibilities for coordination and funding of transit service. 
Out of this discovery process, um, there were a few key findings that emerged. The first recommendation is that we will likely need to move forward with an interim step prior to pursuing any changes to our existing authority. This interim step would be the opportunity for all interested localities to participate in determining a preferred format for decision making around transit in our region and determine what information may need to be developed or provided in order to inform decisions around cost allocations and funding distributions. There seems to be a general consensus that some level of regional transit, transit governance is warranted, but there remain outstanding questions whether a regional approach is going to be the right solution for all of our for all of the individual jurisdictions. Continued work towards formally establishing the organizational structure will aid better understanding and clear decisions about participation for each local governing body. We consistently heard over the course of the study that there is additional information that is needed to help rural areas understand the actual transit need for residents in their localities. Being able to answer this question would enable local governments to more comfortably make decisions about their participation in their regional approach to transit. We also heard consistently that local government officials wanted to uh, be able to clearly demonstrate the value of their participation in a regional approach and establish accountability measures to ensure that each jurisdiction receives local benefit for their investment into the, into the regional system. Each jurisdiction will have unique needs that should be considered to determine how a regional approach may support local transit goals. As we move into drafting potential legislation, we want to encourage continued engagement with our rural jurisdictions to ensure that these interests are captured and accounted for. It became clear through our discovery process that it would be important to continue to keep the University of Virginia engaged as we determine what regional transit governance should look like. As we've learned through our review of peer cases, there's a wide range of options for how local governments and transit systems coordinate service with local universities. As an operator of its own transit system, ongoing collaborations with the University of Virginia could help the region leverage additional public funding or introduce cost-saving measures, such as shared transit maintenance facilities and training programs. To be clear, we don't know what exactly the role of the University of Virginia should be in this transit um, authority moving forward, but we do think it is important to continue to engage them as a, as a key stakeholder in our region. To determine funding options to support the increased transit service throughout the region, the AECOM consultant team began by reviewing the funding sources that are in place for the existing transportation authorities of the state of Virginia. Um, those are shown in the list to the left. From there, the consultant team narrowed down potential funding options to the list that are shown to the right. These are based on what is likely um, going to be feasible funding or revenue generation options based on um, changes to legislation and what may be palatable um, on a statewide basis. These resources could be utilized to generate direct funding for transit. So looking at what the characteristics might be for a regional transit authority, there are two main ways that we could move forward with enacting um, the, the regional transit authority. The first would be to create completely new legislation that included a funding component, and then the second would be to modify the existing transit authority legislation that was enacted um, in 2009. Either of these options would require action by the General Assembly. The initial membership of the authority would include Charlottesville and Albemarle as members, represented by members of their governing bodies, with options for Fluvanna, Green, Louisa, and Nelson County to join as well. The existing authorization language also allows for participation by private, nonprofit, tourist driven agencies, which is a little bit of a mouthful, higher education facilities, and public transport agencies serving the counties. And the, the, the role of those um, other non-governmental entities would be as non-voting members to the authority. As we wrap up the study, we want to emphasize that this is really just the beginning of establishing a more formal body to coordinate and plan for transit throughout our region. We will be providing a final report of the study to all of the localities to review, and we will be continuing discussions with each locality about their transit needs and interest in considering participation in the regional efforts. The TJPDC is prepared to keep this momentum moving by identifying a working group to stand up the existing structure while we determine what preferred next steps might be. 
We know that Albemarle County and the City of Charlottesville are ready to move forward to begin working out the mechanisms um, activating the existing authority, and we will continue to engage with all of the localities in our region that would like to explore what their participation and involvement might look like. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions at this time? One of these changes potential to occur, potentially occur. Yeah, that, that, that is kind of the, um, the golden question that, that we're getting asked. The next, the immediate next step would be to, for us to start uh, forming a working group that would start putting bylaws and, and statutes in place that would allow the um, existing um, authority to be enacted. So that would be the immediate next step and that would be likely to occur probably in the next calendar year. Um, after that, I think it's a question of what comes out of that working group or the establishment of, of, of that group that wants to remain committed as to um, you know, what, what do we need to do to build buy-in with the General Assembly to move forward on any changes to the legislation, et cetera. So I think we have, in the short term, we know that we're moving forward with some very clear short-term steps, and the rest of it is a little bit dependent on um, getting that working group moving forward and determining what um, their desire is. Yeah, you know, I mean, the people who need, need this are, are not wealthy people. The other people, you know, who is pushing? Who is going to push for them? Is... Well, we are really, so we know, we know that, um, I, as I mentioned, we know that there is interest in moving this forward from the city of Charlottesville and Albemarle County. We are continuing to engage all of the localities in our region. So I think it would really be up to um, the will of you all as the decision makers for your locality to determine what Nelson County's engagement would look like and remain engaged in um, the next steps for the, the, the authority. Do you, do you have any, any reason to believe this is gonna happen? <laughs> I have reason to believe, well, we already have authorizing I mean, legislation. These, these transportation needs are not new. Sure, we, we already have authorizing legislation and there does seem to be momentum and support um, to, to at least stand up what was already um, enabled, which has not been stood up before. So we are moving forward on that front, which will allow us to have more formal coordination regionally. The rest of it, I think we are optimistic that we are committed to moving forward with trying to go back to the General Assembly, but we also want to be mindful that um, there may be other work we need to do to be building support or building buy-in with the General Assembly as well. So we want to be thoughtful about how we um, engage that, that next step at the General Assembly level. Um, I'm, I can provide a little more information. I've been part of the study committee and uh, Sandy laid it out pretty clearly which is it's not clear um, how the benefits would be shared to the rural areas relative to Charlottesville Albemarle and so that's kind of an ongoing question that we don't have an answer to at this point but um, just so y'all know um, John is concurrently at the same at, actually <laughs> this very moment um, having meetings about uh, doing a needs assessment for uh, the John service area, which of course includes us. Um, we've had, I've had some problems with that because the first two meetings that they've had have been scheduled on the second Tuesday of the month, which is also the same time that we have our Board of Supervisor meetings. So uh, even though I'm on that committee, I have not been able to participate in the meeting which they had today or the one they had previously about this. Well, so, keep you out, isn't it? well um, <laughs> I know they're doing their best to get it scheduled and I and to try to try to get everybody there, but it's the problem with us is that you know I'm I'm not gonna miss this. So um, keeping in touch with John is something I'm gonna have to continue to do, even though I haven't been there and I'm gonna do the best I can, but um, the, you know, the, the question that the rural areas have, which, you know, we, which I put forth, is that um, it's, you know, because we are in a unique place where we have, uh, 
we're kind of midway between Lynchburg and Charlottesville, many of our transportation needs actually go south. And Jaunt doesn't serve uh, virtually at all to uh, from Nelson County to Lynchburg, whereas they do within the, the planning district area, which includes Charlottesville and Albemarle. So um, I think that we have to look pretty carefully at um, you know what's going to serve our unique community better um, to be a part of this, to maybe look at uh, you know, maybe a joint relationship with the Southern District that has to do with Lynchburg and Amherst, um, or what kind of transit um, can solve the unique problems that we've got. Um, so um, I think we're going to have a more difficult time, certainly, than Charlottesville Albemarle moving forward on this. Whether we want to be a part of this or not is something we will have to determine, and I think that John study would go far, so I'm going to do my best to make sure that we have a better understanding about our transportation needs before making them. I, I agree wholeheartedly with um, Supervisor Reed that you know it's pretty hard to flesh out right now how uh, this authority might benefit the rural localities. Um, yeah. Remains to be seen. And like Mr. Barton said, we we definitely have needs. There's no question. But trying to come up with a solution for that is you know is probably going to be broader than even this initiative. Understood. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, real quick, before we go to a break, we have, let's just try to get the funding request for Lovings and Beautification. These folks have been here for a couple hours now. Uh, Carla and Gail, would you guys mind coming up real quick? Just Gail? I'll be brief. Sounds great. Um, my name is Gail Bastrash, and uh, I'm the other 80 Orchard Road here in Lovingston. And I've lived here three years. I moved here from North Carolina to help with child care for my daughter, who lives in Montebello, and drops off her children at my house every day. So I found uh, lots of opportunities in Lovingston. I love living here. And I have worked with a group of people who are working on beautification for our town. And you might have noticed that uh, there's been changes in the past few years. It can't be attributed to me, but I'd like to take credit. But we would like to uh, request $2,000 for expenses for the years 2024 to 2025 for beautification uh, of the town of Lovingston. And I'll just read the brief paragraph that I submitted in the past few years, any efforts at beautification through flowers, benches, signage, and flower pots for the town of Lovingston have been funded through donations and recently a bake sale. Uh, I've been keeping that money in my sock drawer and I get it out to pay for beautification. That was $230. Uh, volunteers have provided monetary donations, labor and maintenance of flowers and shrubs, the paintings of the murals. Since Lovingston is the county seat, we want to take crowd in our town and work on ways to keep it attractive to visitors as well as locals. It would be helpful to have this funding so we don't have to go asking people for it or taking it out of our own pocket. Um, some things that would be used for would be replacing the older barrels whose wood is breaking down, staying in preservative for the new barrels. If you drive through town, you can see uh, we think it's attractive uh, decorations for the holidays. Replenishing potting soil in the barrels, which is a big project, fertilized for plantings, seasonal flowers and decorations, putting more flowers in towns and areas that are barren right now. Uh, labor for heavy lifting and digging maintenance so we don't have to ask a strong man off the street to come and dig a hole for us, which I have done on two occasions. Uh, and then miscellaneous uh, beautification projects for the future. Uh, Patty Turpin and I would manage an account, we would call it the beautification account, if we can get this funding. 
uh, the Levinson Beautification account, and uh, we would uh, kind of monitor each other, and we could also be audited if needed uh, to see where our money's going. Uh, thank you for your consideration. And the other people on the committee right now that agreed for this request and have told me that I need to do it are um, Patty Avalon, Carlin Pock, uh, Quinnival, Vicki Vestal, Larry Wells, and Patty Turpin. Thank you for your consideration. And I wonder if you consider this, when would we know? You're going to find out here in a second. Oh, okay. All right. Um, first and foremost, thank you for coming here. For those who don't know, uh, the efforts of maintaining the flowers in Lovingston has, uh, has been an effort that I know Patty and uh, Patty Turpin has been doing for years and years and years. Uh, it is unnoticed. I think it is it's tiny projects like that that really bring a vibrance to our community. You know, in Lovingston specifically, you know, we were just talking about all the new things that are happening, um, from the heart of Nelson to Patty Avalon Studio to the new uh, seamstress down the street to uh, antique. the antique portion of uh, right across from uh, the heart of Nelson, and all these things are starting to create a new vibrance in our community. Um, the flowers, I think, is just one extra thing to that. Um, I think it'd be awesome if this board would be interested in supporting that and still contributing to that Lovingston efforts. And oh, in the farmer's market. You know, talk about a new vibrant thing as well. Lots of farmers from this side of 29 have been able to participate on not necessarily the high usage days at like Nellie's Ford, but you know, in their off days during the week, you know, on Wednesday, uh, they've been able to find a new source of revenue. So. Um, what's this board think? So, um, Mr. Chairman yeah. and Gail, thank you for all of your efforts. It's it's funny, I was just visiting with Patty Turpin on Saturday, and uh, we were standing on our front porch looking, just what you can see from her front porch, all of the changes that have been uh, made recently, and, and um, the renovation of the church across the street, and all right. that, and it just, it, it makes a big difference. Um, so thank you all for your efforts. but. Um, I move that we allocate $2,000 for the funding request to Nelson County um, for the Lovingston Beautification Volunteers uh, for the 2024-25 period. All right. Motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second for Mr. Barton. Any further discussion? Yes. Okay, Mr. Harvey. I just got some questions that uh, I know they've been trying to do some things over the afternoon and not Nellis Ford way. And why isn't that included in it? These folks work in, they work in Lovingston. They're not part, they don't live in Nellie's Ford. Okay. And we think of it as being the county seat. So yeah. people from the whole county are in and out all the time. Yeah. I don't think if, if somebody in Nellie's Ford wanted to bring up something like that, I'm sure Mr. Reed would make sure we can correspond with them. You know, I mean, no, I just, you have funding and people are volunteering. To do the work and you're not paying them and they're using the money for other reasons. For instance, uh, the example that was brought up in the public comments about the celebration of upkeep, right. um, we, we need to fund that too. Sure. Now that would be, how much were you? It was $5,000. Yeah, let, let's do both of those. Well, that's on, that's I mean, I've got that on the directives. board reports under Later in the agenda. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we could do both. Take a break. <coughs> All right. We have a motion. We have a second. We have a second. All right. So, any further discussion for the two thousand dollars for beautification? Hearing none. Let's do. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Harvey. No. Mr. Barton. Yes. Mr. Parr. Yes. Mr. Reed. Yes. Mr. Rutherford. Yes. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. You guys wanted to bring up Juneteenth real quick. The. Um, our camp. Uh, before we move on, can we just get clarification? Is this for calendar year 2024, 25, uh, or fiscal year? Gail, Gail, real quick, before we get going too far. Are we talking calendar year 2024? Yes, to 25? January. So this will take from January 2024 to? December 2025. December, so that's two years. Two years. Got it. So two years. Okay. All right. I'm just trying to figure out when the funds would be expected. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Juneteenth, is that what you all wanted to discuss this time? Mr. Yeah. Park? Um, I, I, I'd like to 
I don't know, Bip, I don't know if you wanted to make a motion to uh, fund uh, the Juneteenth initiative. And yeah, I'll right make a motion. Okay. Might as well do it. Yeah, and Let's I would, get clear on what we're doing. Um, I'm hurting the cold. What we're, this is what we're doing. Um, in America, there was, uh, there was slavery. And um, we celebrate our independence from, from uh, England. And slavery was based on racism. Racism was wrong and is wrong. And, and there's an attempt to celebrate the end of slavery in this country. And in the last several years, there have been celebrations in Nelson County to celebrate the end of slavery, which has freed us all to a certain extent. So we're going to fund a celebration of the end of slavery. That's what that's about. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second from Mr. Reed. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Harvey? You got me confused. No. Mr. Barton? Yes. Mr. Parr? Yes. Mr. Reed? Yes. Mr. Rutherford? Yes. All right, we're going to take a five minute recess.